If you need extensions for the homework, you know, just let me know. I think you have a homework this week. Okay, so where did we stop? We stopped last time here uh, talking about Fritz Zwicky. So there is a question on, on the test. And he's the one who um, predicted dark matter. So what did he do for that? He was observing a cluster of galaxies. Okay, so it's galaxies inside a cluster, a group of galaxies. And this one was called the Coma Cluster. So that was in 1933. And you see galaxies inside the group, they are not static. Everything in the universe is dynamic. So those galaxies, they were moving past each other, but they were moving too fast, faster than you can um, explain. So it means if they are moving, okay, it's because there is a tug on them, that's because you have gravity. And when you compute all the things that you can see, okay, you can compute the mass of the galaxies and the black holes. And so at the time they didn't know about black hole, but if you do all the computation of the mass, you cannot explain why the galaxies were moving so fast. So it predicted dark matter. However, his colleagues at the time didn't really take him seriously, too seriously, because of course, if you go around and uh, insult your uh, colleague saying, you know, they are spherical bastards, it's not very good for um, connection, right? You're not going to make many friends. But nevertheless, he was a genius. He was from Switzerland and he predicted uh, dark matter. And then he also predicted supernovae, so neutron stars. So at the time, they didn't call them neutron star, but he predicted that if you have a very large star, a massive star, it will collapse on its own in a supernova. And you must have like some leftover that today we call neutron star. So he predicted that, among, among other things. And then, so for that, he was not... A, taken very seriously, but in uh, 1970, I forgot to talk about that. So I put that link in your uh, canvas. Um, you have Vera, her name was Reva Robin. And what she did, she looked at how fast inside the galaxy, okay, so inside the galaxy, so each galaxy have a black hole at the center. And the stars at the edge of the galaxy are supposed to move slower than the star closer to the black hole, toward the center, right? So the star far away at the edge of the galaxies are supposed to move slower. You see the same thing in our solar system. So Mercury is moving faster around the sun than Jupiter, for example. That's because, again, of the tug farther away you are from the mass, so well, it's going to move. And it was not the case. Those stars, along with the gas, were moving so fast. I mean, faster than they are supposed to, to move. And uh, that's, that was another proof for uh, dark matter. That was in 1970. You can, you can look up. Uh, she has an interesting um, history, a story or so. So she, she did that observation with her um, advisor and um, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking which, um, so she, yes, that's, she was looking at the stars around the galaxy. So interesting, for example, she, she actually applied, she was supposed to go to Princeton University so she applied there, and at the time, in the 1950s, you know, they didn't take women. So she could not go to Princeton University, so she went to Cornell instead. So if you're interested, you can uh, look up her story here. Okay, and the other thing I forgot to tell you is that, so when he did this prediction, and that's a nice review also for the test, he looked at a cluster of galaxies called Coma, the Coma Cluster. And I don't know, I had a picture for that. Oh, here. So you see here, 
I don't know if you can see the comma cluster somewhere, but we are here. So the comma cluster uh, Fritz Wiki was using to predict dark matter is part of this comma supercluster. So a supercluster, it means it's a group of group of galaxies. So that uh, comma cluster that you use was located here. It's nice here because you can see the structure of the uh, universe around us. And you see here we are inside the Virgo supercluster. So inside the Virgo supercluster, so it's a review. We have our local group where the Milky Way is. We have the Virgo cluster. Remember where they found the first, uh, they were able to find, to take the picture of the first black hole. And you see you have all those super clusters all around. And you see if, if you zoom out, you can see this structure in a, in a cosmic way. Okay. And dark matter is found, you know, all along those filaments that you can see. So that's what the universe looks like uniformly all over. Okay. Because it is thought that just after the Big Bang, there was this huge explosion, okay, expansion of the universe itself. And it was so fast that things didn't have time to evolve in different manner at, at, uh, in uh, different parts of the universe, right? So just to give you an idea, I don't know what it is. Come on, we are close to... Oh, that's our supercluster, the Virgo supercluster, and uh, the local group is somewhere there. So recently, I don't know if it was in 2000 something, 2000 something, the 2014. So you see, we keep finding out about the universe. This is quite amazing. 2014, they, they discover, they find out that our supercluster of galaxies here, okay, so we have the Virgo supercluster, all this neighborhood here made of supercluster is part of another super, super cluster. And that supercluster is called the Laniakia, right? So they keep finding stuff. Okay, so that falls for, um, and I, I already put uh, the, the link, Vera Robin and dark matter. So um, some some colleagues didn't take him seriously, so now they, they did. And now another proof for dark matter, I was telling you, is what is called gravitational lensing. So you see here you have a cluster of galaxies, and what is holding them together and make them move really fast relative to each other is that stuff that we don't understand and we call that dark matter. It's about 20, oh, then another question for test two. Right? So dark matter is about 25% and then you have dark energy is about 75%, right? So from our perspective here, you see that light coming from that galaxy is going to be deflected because there is so much dark matter that it's going to curve space time. Okay, it's going to make a curve here. So light will be deflected here. So it's it's behaving like a magnifying glass. So you see here, I have a magnifying glass. You look at the bulb, light will be deflected here. So you're going to see a virtual image much, much bigger. That's how magnifying glass work. Do you understand any question? Okay, and in 2004, there was a big breakthrough with the, what we call the bullet cluster, 2004, and that was the nail in, in the coffin. I mean, that, that nailed it, right? That was the proof for, uh, another proof for dark matter. So it's a, it's a nice video. I'm gonna see if I, if I have it here. I just have to find it. Cosmic, do you see it? Mm. Yeah. You are watching a Nova Science Now video podcast. See, it's a, it's a super cute uh, demo that they did. So it's with uh, the famous uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
but he's the one also. That was in 2004. In 2006, he's the one, that's another question on the test, right? He's the one who demoted Pluto. So if I ask you, how many planets do we have? It's not nine anymore. Pluto has been demoted. It's uh, eight. Makes me very sad. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Okay. My galaxies are purple. What color are yours? Uh, mine are sky blue. Sky. Here at Nova, we do a lot of things in the name of science. Are you ready? Are you ready. One. Two. Just ask Three. Nova Science Now host Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> and not all of it is done purely for fun. Like astronomer Doug Clow, sometimes we're trying to explore the deepest mysteries of the universe. And dark matter is definitely one of those mysteries. When astronomers uh, refer to dark matter, right, we, we mean something that doesn't interact with light in any way. It doesn't, it doesn't... Maybe it's too fast. I think because they already speak fast. Are you, are you listening or doing something else? Yeah. Absorb light. Scientists like Clow think dark matter makes up 20-some percent of our universe. Ooh, no, no, sorry, sorry. I want normal speed, not the faster. This is definitely one of those uh, mysteries. mysteries. When astronomers uh, uh, refer to dark matter, right? We we mean something that doesn't interact with light in any way. It doesn't give off light. It doesn't uh, absorb light. Scientists like Clow think dark matter makes up twenty some percent of our universe, but there's something else they aren't so sure about. We don't know what dark matter is. <laughs> We think it's probably some sort of particle that we haven't discovered yet, but it might turn out to be something different. We're not entirely sure. So why is Clow convinced that it actually exists? Say hello to the bullet cluster. Two immense groups of galaxies billions of light years away that offer some clues in the dark matter mystery. So the bullet cluster is actually made up of two separate clusters of galaxies. About 100 million years ago, gravity has pulled them together and smashed them into each other. So in this, in this collision, we, we have these, these, these two types of matter. We, we have the galaxies, and, and we have the 100 million degree gas, which sits between all the galaxies. 100 million degree gas, yeah. So what, you might be asking, do the galaxies and gas of the bullet cluster have to do with dark matter? Let's create a mini bullet cluster collision to demonstrate, and here to help is Neil deGrasse Tyson. So when we take these two separate clusters of galaxies in the, in the bullet cluster and smash them together, the galaxies continue straight on without, without really any effect. The gas clouds, however, are going to behave just like any other sort of gas, and so they actually do collide. This is going to slow them down. And so now when we look at this cluster about 100 million years later, the galaxies are moving faster than the gas clouds, and so they're going to be further away from, from the center of this collision. In the center of this collision are the intergalactic gas clouds lagging behind the faster-moving galaxies. The, the, the galaxies are now in a physically separate part of the sky from what the gas is. And so we've separated out the two types of matter which we can see. Now here's the important part. Matter creates gravity. More matter, more gravity. 90% of this matter is in the gas cloud, and so that is where the gravity should be. But when all the data was put together, that wasn't the case. Instead, we see that most of the gravity is actually around the galaxies. And that tells us that something else has to be there causing this gravity. It can't just be the stars and the galaxies themselves. So is this evidence for dark matter? Let's ask three top experts in the field. There is clearly some stuff there that, that is not normal matter, and that's making a lot of gravity. I, I really believe that there, really, there is some dark matter there. So I think the bullet cluster really is the silver bullet that kills off a lot of theories trying to explain away dark matter. Although the dark matter mystery isn't completely resolved, we may have good reason to be grateful for this mysterious stuff. 
Dark matter is basically the glue that holds all the large structures in any universe together. So without dark matter, we would not currently be here. So three cheers for dark matter, whatever it may be. So that's a nice video. So that's about dark matter. So if I ask you again, 25% about, okay, it's dark matter. 75% about, or 70% is dark energy. And the rest is about 5%, you know, if you round, of everything we know. So if you include the black holes, the stars, and the neutron stars, and the gas, and the dust, and the regular stars, that's only 5% of the universe, right? So there is a lot of things that we still do not understand. So that was 1930s, 2004, the bullet cluster. And then another breakthrough happened in the 60s about the cosmic microwave background. And I just have a question about that in the test. So if, if the Big Bang was true, and it seems to be true because Edwin Hubble was able to show the expansion of the universe, another typical question, if something is coming toward you, it's going to be what, red-shifted or blue-shifted? Blue shifted, right? Yeah. And if it's moving away from us, then it's red shifted. That's called the Doppler effect. So anyway, if the universe has been expanding even since, you see here that's a 2D universe. So the light that could escape just after the Big Bang. So before that, it was too hot. So light could not escape and electrons could not be with photons. You know, electrons were free and wandering around. It was like a hot plasma. So electrons will absorb light, emit light, absorb light, emit light. So no light could escape. Finally, when the universe started to cool down, electrons were able to combine with their nuclei and light was able to escape. This light, we think, was maybe in the UV part of the spectrum because it was very hot. Okay, so anything emitting radiation, you can find the temperature. So it must be in the UV. And then the universe has been expanding. So this after after glow. Okay, so from from the Big Bang, this after glow used to be in the, the blue UV, and then it has been stretched out. So today, it's in the microwave, okay? I, I already explained that to you if I, if I go back and know how to go back now. Cosmic, cosmic, cosmic microwave, you see? If you have an electromagnetic wave, you're gonna stretch out. If it's stretching out because it's part of the universe, it's gonna change the wavelength. Okay, so I already show you. No, if you can see here, my universe. Now, if you have good uh, eyesight because you are young, can you see my little wave that I made here? Can you all see it? So you see how the universe was expanding. That little wave here that escaped from the Big Bang was stretched out. Okay, so it went from UV or blue to the microwave. And that was predicted by someone named George Gamo. So he was a professor, uh, he was doing research at um, Princeton, Princeton University. So you can uh, look him up um, here. Okay, so he did that um, very famous paper, paper where he predicted that cosmic microwave background, okay? And he was about to set an experiment to detect it, and someone did before him, okay? And it was, it was just by chance, so I will uh, talk about that. The experiment here in the 1960, and I will show you the experiment that they did, the, those scientists, they are not actually physicists, they were engineering engineers, Arnio Pencia and Robert Wilson, okay? So they were also working for Bell Lab in New Jersey, okay, close to Princeton, 
like Jansky. So they were uh, engineer, engineers and they were hired. So they were graduate students, okay? Um, not not anymore. I think they, we, we, they were just uh, done with graduate school and they were hired by Bell Lab, try to scan the, the sky, try to pinpoint any hiss, any noise, any static that could disturb the radio telecommunication that were, uh, was developed at the time. And that's how they found the cosmic microwave background. Um, sadly, they didn't share the Nobel Prize. You know, when you have a Nobel Prize, you get a lot of money, like a big amount of money. You cannot share more than three. You cannot have more than three people. So they didn't share it with uh, George Gamow. I think they should because he's the one who predicted it. And when they were able to detect that he is the afterglow after the Big Bang, okay, they contacted George Gamow, who explained, yes, that's what you should have if you have a Big Bang, right? If it's a universe that expand, was expanding since the Big Bang. So they didn't share it. So anyway, I have a very nice video to explain the cosmic microwave background. Um, it's a uh, it's a very famous YouTube channel. I think it's this one. If you look up at the night sky in any direction, past all the stars and more stars and galaxies and super... So it's called the Minute Physics, and it's a very famous um, channel. It's very nice. Don't, don't Clusters of galaxies, you will see light that has been traveling for 13.7 billion years to reach Earth. It's the oldest and most primeval light in the universe. A picture of our cosmos in its hot, younger years, and it's called the cosmic background radiation. Of course, you can't really see this light with your naked eyes, because it's in the microwave band of the electromagnetic spectrum. But it is visible to radios and radio telescopes, and even makes up a small portion of the salt and pepper on an analog TV. Where does this luminescent background come from? Well, just after the Big Bang, the entire universe was still so small it would have been very dense, scorchingly hot, and because it hadn't yet had time to get rough and uneven, it would also have been scrumptiously smooth. For a while, things would have been so sweltering that electrons didn't settle down as parts of atoms or molecules, but instead roamed freely in a kind of red-hot cosmic soup. That soup would have had lots of light bouncing around it, too, scattering off of electrons and protons like a hall of mirrors. However, as the universe expanded, there was less and less energy to be had in any one place. And when things had cooled to just below the temperature of the sun, pairs of electrons and protons no longer had the energy to resist each other, and they fell into the electromagnetic embrace we call the hydrogen atom. These electrons were so enamored by their new proton love interests that they effectively began to ignore all the light bouncing around them. So with fewer free electrons for light to interact with, the universe suddenly became transparent, and all the pent-up light was sent forth in whatever direction it had been headed after its last scattering, doomed to travel alone and unnoticed through the cosmos. That is, until it bumps into something solid. When we finally see it here on Earth, this light has been stretched so much by the 13 billion year expansion of space that, like a record slowing down, its frequency and color have shifted from the original sunlight white all the way to cool microwaves. Thus, it's often called the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMB. And just as we can tell the temperature of a red or white hot iron from its glow, this light tells us the temperature of empty space, currently around 2.725 Kelvin, or minus 270 degrees Celsius. However, the universe isn't exactly 2.725 Kelvin in every direction. If we look closely, there are small and seemingly random but noticeable bumps all over the place, kind of like milk that's starting to curdle. Our best understanding is that these cosmic curds formed as quantum fluctuations in the otherwise creamy infant universe, and then began to coagulate as the universe cooled and expanded. It's hard to overstate just how small or unbumpy these fluctuations of temperature and density were to begin with. The hot or cold spots were only hotter or colder than their surroundings by a factor of about 1 in 100,000. That's like noticing that a bacteria makes a beach ball bigger. But while this clumping of the universe initially resulted in small variations like the ones we see in the CMB, later on the chunky curds of primordial soup attracted each other gravitationally, and they ultimately coagulated and coalesced to form all of the massive structures in the universe that we see today, like planets, stars, galaxies, galaxies, and superclusters of galaxies. So when we look up at the night sky, past those galaxies, and see the ancient light of the cosmic microwave background radiation, we're literally seeing the starting point, the proverbial cream, if you will, from which the starry curds of the universe congeal. Or quite simply, proof that the moon really is made of cheese. 
To give you a more complete experience of how awesome the cosmic background radiation is, we've made an adventure. Okay, any question? So they, they did the discovery of the uh, afterglow. Okay, uh, in 1960 something, and that led to the Nobel Prize. So they they had this huge antenna to scan the sky. Now the story is that at the beginning they could not understand where that hiss was coming from. They thought it's some noise. We we turn the antenna to Princeton or New York City. You know, we hear the hiss, but we turn it away. We still hear the hiss. So there was a ghost over there, just opened the door. Um, and they, they thought there was a pigeons, you know, pigeons, they um, they had their nest inside. So they thought maybe it comes from the dropping of the pigeon. So they took the pigeon, sent them away, you know, very far away in New Jersey, but the pigeon came back. So uh, the technician brought a shotgun and uh, they killed the pigeon, but it, it didn't work. Right, so that's when they contacted um, George Gamow. So they were engineers. So that discovery happened by chance. I have another very nice video here. Maybe I will uh, speed it up. Before astronomers, astronomers could even begin to understand the life and death of stars, new telescopes would have to be built that could look at the sky in many different wavelengths. Before that could happen, though, Radio astronomy produced another great discovery that, although predicted, was as unexpected by its discoverers as Jansky had been. Do you remember Jansky, another engineer for Bell Lab, did that amazing discovery again by chance? He was the first one to detect radio waves coming from the supermassive black hole. So that was the beginning of radio astronomy. And once again, it happened at Bell Labs in Homedale, New Jersey. In 1964, Bell Labs had this spare 20-foot microwave antenna sitting dormant. Rather than destroy it, the lab decided to let astronomers use it for research. Two physicists, 31-year-old Arno Penzias and 28-year-old Robert Wilson, decided to use the antenna for measuring the temperature of the gas halo surrounding the Milky Way galaxy. What happened next is one of the most exciting discoveries in modern astronomy. Hi, Bill. Dr. Wilson. Great. And I came to Bell Labs to get the story firsthand from Robert Wilson himself. Two of us, Arnold Penzias and I, had just come to Bell Labs from graduate school, and we were going to measure radiation from the Milky Way. And that's where this antenna really fit in, because we could reject the radiation from the Earth. And what was left is uh, what's coming from the sky. You're only getting about two degrees from the Earth's atmosphere. Maybe pick up one degree from the walls of this thing. But when we first turned it on, it was about twice that. It was seven degrees. And this just wasn't right. Something from the Earth uh, must be in our instrumentation. We, of course, are on a hill here that overlooks New York City. We had the ideal instrument for checking on that, though. We merely turn it down to the horizon, scan the horizon, and lo and behold, nothing particular extra. There was a pair of pigeons that lived in here, and of course it was covered with white pigeon droppings. So we thought, well, maybe the pigeon droppings are doing more than we think. Arno and I got up in here and we cleaned all the pigeon droppings out. It got rid of the pigeons. What happened? Where did you get rid of the pigeons? Well, first we put them in the company mail and sent them as far as we could, which was Whippany, New Jersey. Uh, to a pigeon fancier there who said, these are junk pigeons and let them go. A couple of days later, they were back. <laughs> 40 miles away, they yes. came back. Yes. So then our technician brought in a shotgun. And then how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't here. I didn't see it. But basically, it didn't, didn't solve our problem. We still had an extra three, four degrees. We were really beginning to be perplexed because you know, we believe in physics. Mm -hmm. It's coming from somewhere. We can calculate what the horn is doing, except for this excess noise. At the time that Penzias and Wilson detected the radio static, there were two competing theories about the origin of the universe. There was the Big Bang Theory, which Hubble's expanding universe supported. And there was the steady state theory, 
which proposed that the universe is timeless, with no beginning or end, expanding forever. When a friend heard what Penzias and Wilson had found, he suggested they get in touch with some cosmologists at Princeton University, who were advocates of the Big Bang Theory. They believed that a Big Bang would have left a faint thermal afterglow in the universe, traces of heat from the roar of the bang itself, detectable across the entire sky. And they were about to conduct research in hopes of measuring that afterglow. We invited them over. They came over and looked at what we had done and immediately agreed that we had measured what they were setting out to do. So what does your discovery mean? Well, it means that we live in a Big Bang universe and uh, that we're seeing the radiation from 300,000 years after the Big Bang. In many cases, when there's a paradigm shift in science, it takes a generation before people really accept it. But in this case, I think the world was ready for it. Human societies have always worried about where they came from. There are religious stories in every civilization that's ever been found. And I think we have a de definitive answer, that we came out of a Big Bang. So poor pigeon, they sacrifice, sacrifice their life to science. And now just the last video, because we watch it already, but I stopped uh, at the very end. Power horse, not six point lost, 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 when I may hear the four but see the fossil record, fossil record of this big bang he chose. In 1940. So the, the term Big Bang, it was a joke, right? They, they wanted to make fun of Edwin Hubble, you know, theory, okay? So that's why they call it, it, it was coined by a journalist who made the fun by, by using the term Big Bang. The American physicists, George Gamow, Hans Bethe, and Ralph Uffer, published an article in which they described what this fossil would have to look like. Residual heat in space, a kind of background radiation. They assumed that the Big Bang would have generated an enormous amount of heat. True, the universe had had more than 13 billion years to cool down, but even so, a minimal background radiation was to be expected, just above the absolute zero of minus 273 degrees Celsius. In the mid-1960s, the Bell Telephone Company was carrying out tests in connection with satellite broadcasting. In the process, engineers Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson detected a constant background signal. In order to identify this noise, they calculated the temperature of its source and found it was comparable to that of liquid helium, which is within two degrees of absolute zero. The temperature of the radiation they had noticed was just above that of liquid helium. In other words, also close to absolute zero. So Penzias and Wilson had unknowingly discovered the predicted cosmic background radiation, which underpinned the Big Bang theory. For this epoch-making discovery, they were awarded the 1978 Nobel Prize for Physics. So in Sweden, technological progress soon provided more evidence for the Big Bang. In 1992, the satellite Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE for short, detected oscillations in the temperature of the background radiation. The COBE chart shows the universe at the age of about 300,000 years. The blue areas represent regions with a lot of matter, the red areas with not so much. To obtain new data about the universe, for the past decade, astronomers have been using the space telescope named after Edwin Powell Hubble. In March 2004, it took the most distant photograph ever, and this also means it shows the oldest objects. Some of the galaxies discovered must have been created a good 13.3 billion years ago. Today, most scientists believe that the universe has always been expanding and will go on doing so. The basis for this view was provided by Edwin Powell Hubble in long nights of intensive observation of the heavens. Okay, so 
that led to a Nobel Prize. Yeah, let's see. Oh, it's my slide. Yeah. Okay, so just happened by chance. So again, the cosmic microwave background is just the afterglow of the Big Bang, right? So if you look, if you look at that uh, microwave background, okay, you can see what the universe looked like when it was a baby, just after, like a very eighty thousand years after, after the the Big Bang. Okay, so today. We use uh, satellites, okay? So that was in 1965. You see the hits here, but you don't see the details. That, that experiment also showed that the universe, the temperature of the universe, you know, went far away from cluster of galaxies in the vacuum, it's about minus 350, minus 350 Fahrenheit. So it's very cold. So if, if the universe keep expanding the way it does and accelerating, everything will be ripped apart, right? And we'll, uh, we'll end up in the darkness and coolness, right? If everything moves from each other, uh, the temperature will keep uh, decreasing. So that was 1992, you had Kobe. So they sent like a special uh, space probe to look back, 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 you know, at the baby universe. And this 2003, they improved it, and then 2009, then I have another picture here, that's what the universe looks like, okay, baby universe. So what you see, it's really the afterglow, but you see that some places, it's going to be hotter than other places. So these here are the galaxies in, in formation. So you have the cluster of galaxies here that are being, uh, uh, all, all the matter here being clumped together because you have dark matter and you have the baby universe, you have the baby galaxies uh, to be in formation. So you're gonna learn uh, in, in the coming unit that anything, anything that emits radiation like us, okay, uh, will have a temperature. So we, by looking at the radiation, we can tell the temperature. So if I look at you, and if it was all dark, and I have those special night vision, I will see you shining in infrared. And by looking at the wavelength of the infrared, the heat wave that all of you, because thank God you are alive, emit, I can tell exactly what's your temperature. Okay, so here the same thing, it's some form of radiation, it's microwave, and by collecting this microwave uh, radiation, you can tell the temperature. So you can tell that here it's hotter than there, that's because gravity is pulling things together to make a cluster of galaxies. Is that clear? So by, for example, if I look at the sun, there I measure its peak wavelength, so the sun likes to emit a lot of green. So I collect the green from the sun, I can tell the temperature of the sun. Okay, so we'll see that um, in the coming unit. And then um, 1970, what was special? Uh, like, you know what they say, history repeats itself. Um, maybe you noticed that the Occidental world is not in good terms with Russia right now. Uh, like it was in 1970, so we are back uh, to the Cold War. So during the Cold War, that was in 1970s. So it was after the Hiroshima bomb. So Hiroshima bomb was an atomic bomb and then developed the hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bomb is thermonuclear bomb. And so the, the two countries, Russia, the Soviet Union at the time, and the US, they were really watching each other to make sure that, you know, are, are they going to test these hydrogen bombs or are we in danger? So there was like a red button uh, to be ready to be pressed, right? And at some point in the 1970s, and that, that's, uh, that's, if you like movie, there was this very famous movie uh, with uh, Peter Sellers, it's called Doctor, Doctor Strangelove. Okay, it was a, a Nazi who was uh, recycled by the American to work on the nuclear, power, nuclear, uh, nuclear um, uh, program. So uh, anyway, uh, so what happened in 1970s? They detected gamma rays first, right? 
So first, they start to freak out. They say, oh, okay, Soviet Union is attacking us, right? Because gamma ray bursts can be coming from a nuclear test. So they are intensifying their nuclear testing. So we have to be ready. Maybe we have to hit first, right? It was really bad. And it was about to, uh, uh, to have a nuclear war at the time. And then, lucky for us, uh, scientists understood that it was not coming from the Soviet Union, it was coming from space. And those bursts are called gamma ray bursts, and you have two kinds of them. So you have the long one and um, the, the, the short one. So the long one, they are the one who can last for more than two seconds, happens when you have a massive star that collapsed, get collapsing, and then you have a supernova that will emit so much energy that it will emit them in the gamma rays range, right? So gamma ray, it's a lot of uh, energetic radiation. And then the, when I made those slides a long time ago, like 20 years ago, they didn't know about the short ones. You also have burp, burp of gamma rays happening in the sky all the time, burp, 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 burp of radiation uh, in the gamma rays. Range, and they didn't understand what it was. And nowadays we think it's when you have two neutron stars, okay, merging together, or neutron star and a black hole, or two black holes um, emerging to uh, emerging to together, they, they're going to burst. They're going to emit a, a gamma ray burst. So that's that's what we know today. See, at the time, I di we didn't know that. So gamma ray burst, okay. So if I ask you a question about that, you will remember. Okay, so you can have two objects very uh, with a lot of mass merging together, and that will give you long gamma ray burst. And the other one, so that will be the short one, the short gamma ray burst, when you have two heavy objects merging with each other, or you can have a long one when the star is dying. But interestingly, that's why I like history. You know, history repeats itself. <laughs> so it's like we are back uh, in the Cold War now, but it almost uh, started a nuclear war at the time. Okay, I think it was Reagan who was in charge. He, he almost hit that button to, to start a war again. Okay, so... Fast forward, we get to the 1990s, and for the first time, so that happened in 1992, they, they were able to detect the first exoplanets. So remember that Giordano Bruno got in trouble and was burned at stake because not only did he support the Copernicus um, heliocentric model, but he also said that Probably you're going to have other planets and maybe uh, life, not, not only on, on Earth, but somewhere else in the universe. So in 1992, so you know, follow the science, sometimes doesn't work that way, because 1992, yes, he was right, you have exoplanets. So very surprising. I think I have, a, let me show you, I have a link. That, okay, exoplanet here, around the pulsar. So what is a pulsar? A pulsar is a neutron star, okay? So it's a leftover from a massive star that died. So it's a leftover and it's very ugly because it's gonna spin really fast and it's emitting all kinds of radiation, including radio, radio wave, right? So it looks like this. I don't know if I have a picture, a video of that. That's what a pulsar looks like. Okay, so it's a neutron star, okay, emitting radio waves in both directions, in addition to other ugly radiation like X-rays or gamma rays, and they found planets around it. That was not supposed to happen. So the first exoplanets were found around the pulsar. So they think that maybe, okay, maybe uh, when the, the star exploded in a supernova, maybe the dust that was left over start to coalesce together and make those planets. 
because it's no way those planets could be here during the explosion. It will wipe out everything, right? So very surprising discovery. So that's what a pulsar looks like. You see, it's a neutron star, but it's spinning really fast, and it looks like a lighthouse. So it can beam, it can send a beam towards you, so you will hear beep and beep and beep. So here, like this. So if, if you have planets around, of course you cannot see the planets. You cannot detect the planets uh, in a, with a direct method. But if, if the planet orbit this neutron star, the neutron star is going to wobble. So the beam is going to be short, long, short, long. So that's how they detected those exoplanets. Isn't that amazing? So that happened in uh, 1992. And then a little bit later, so they thought, will, will we ever find uh, a planet orbiting a star like our star, like the sun? Will, will that will be possible? And it happened in 1995. You have a star like our sun, and they found planets, exoplanets orbiting it, right? So that star, Pegasus here, it's part of Pegasus. Pegasus was a... Uh, a horse with wings, so it's not far from Cygnus, that's a constellation, and that will happen in uh, uh, 51 Pegasi, and that led to a Nobel Prize in 1995, and then they got the Nobel Prize 2019 for the discovery of those exoplanets. <laughs> Isn't that surprising? And then uh, more recent, so they keep finding now exoplanets. They, we are very good at it, and they found like three thousand something exoplanets. And the closest exoplanet ever found was was around Proxima Centauri. Here, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, so it's a star. Okay, that's still burning hydrogen. And except it's red because it's going to burn its fuel very slowly. So that's why it's going to last a very long time. And, and they did find um, in 2016 a planet around our closest neighbor, the closest neighbor to, to our sun. That's why it's called Proxima, Proxima Centauri, because Proxima means in Latin means close. Okay. So that was uh, quite amazing. And there was a guy here from Berkeley University, Geoff Mercy, who, keep, who was uh, very famous to keep finding those new planets. He got in trouble. Um, apparently, I 